Okay, yeah. Um, I'll speak about our um, platform section for Chime. Uh, and uh, Chime is a tool that uh, analyzes metagenomics data, the culture-independent microbial communities. Uh, what we basically learn about them is composition and function of uh, these communities. And it can be um, applied in a bunch of areas like agriculture, where you can study soil properties or any bacteria-driven processes in healthcare, where we can study microbiome, um, microbiomes of different organs, or ecology, where biosensors are developed using um, metagenomics and biodegradation of plastic is also a bacteria-driven process. And of course, biotechnology, the nutrition produced or pharmaceuticals or biofuel, everything is done thanks to bacteria. So um, basically, when we sample our data and we extract DNA um, and then we want to amplify it, we can go two ways. We can either go a uh, whole genome sequencing way or target sequencing way. And in case we want only to sequence the target, 16S uh, ribosomal RNA is uh, the region that mostly is targeted in bacteria because it has both conserved and hypervariable regions. Um, actually, there are nine, just it didn't have a picture good enough for to include it. But these hypervariable regions help us differentiate between um, different species. So 16S um, or target sequencing or amplicon sequencing. It's cheap compared to whole genome sequencing. It's pretty standard. We already know all the primers, so it's easier to conduct. But it's restricted to previously known um, and annotated taxa, and sometimes it's not enough to differentiate between the samples. Also, we only get the compositional information. We don't know any function that are done here. Uh, whole genome sequencing allows us to study novel organisms and we can assemble the reads in, uh, and we can run functional genomics and understand what uh, function this organism does. It's also more information uh, to differentiate between the taxa, but there are a bunch of problems uh, to whole genome sequencing of bacteria because it's expensive, it's hard to understand what is contamination, what is not, and so on. So on the platform, we um, present three modules, uh, pre-processing that um, consists of filtering and denoising uh, algorithms. Then we go on to taxonomy with silver classification, filtering our classified sequences and uh, conducting phylogenetic trees. And then we can move on to metrics to calculate for alpha and beta diversity. So um, at the very beginning, we start with the quality control, and it's very um, important not to include um, regions of low quality because they will interfere with all the downstream analysis with our abundances, with our phylogenetic tree and taxonomy and everything. So you have to um, understand where you want to trim your reads like this so you will not include low quality nucleotides in your downstream analysis. So after filtering the replication, we come to denoising or clustering techniques. Mm. So the idea is that when we first assemble our data, well, we have um, one sec uh, well, sequence per species or something like that. But when we run amplification, there are bound to be some errors and we get small fractions of sequences that are slightly different from our original one. And when we sequence, there are even more errors and more unique sequences. And so we end up with a plethora of unique sequences and um, classic clustering algorithms would look for the most abundant sequence and assign it as a center and cluster everything um, that is 97% similar in one cluster. Um, well, there are a few problems with this approach. And first is that not all the species are 97% similar. Some are a lot more similar. And um, researchers came up with another approach, denoising, which was taking into account uh, different models of errors and sequencing quality calls to try and correct 
the errors, the mistakes, and um, end up with haplotypes. But these haplotypes are 100% similar. So after the noising uh, or clustering, um, for paired entries, uh, there is also option to merge. Well, not an option; it's a obligatory step to merge the reads. Um, since uh, even for targeted sequencing, we can pick different size, uh, different regions, and the size of region may uh, vary. And sometimes the reads are separated like this. Sometimes they overlap and. For example, Dada2 treats them a bit differently. In case they overlap, they only take the part that overlaps. And in case they overhang, it will take one of the reads. And if they are separated, it will concatenate the reads together. So when we sampled our data, extracted DNA, amplified it, and did denoising, we end up with a table like this, where we have counts of each unique representative sequence per sample. And here we can ask ourselves three main questions. Uh, first is how similar or different the things are in one sample? And that will be alpha diversity. Um, second question is how similar or different are the samples between each other? And that will be beta diversity. And the third is what specifically leads to differences between the samples? And that will be uh, taxonomic profiling. We'll start with the third one. So for taxonomy analysis, it is uh, strongly advised to use the same primers that you used for your, um, for your uh, data. So the same region will be extracted from the database. Um, here we use Silva database that is being updated and curated. Um, and you can see the mostly used primers here and primer sequences. So you just take it in sequence, add it to the platform, forward and pr uh, reverse uh, primers, and they will extract the exact regions from the database and run classification. So it will look for uh, if, if the sequence uh, is in the Silva database and it will assign taxonomic unit to the sequences. And you will end up with um, a bar plot showing uh, what bacteria are there in your samples. If you want some of them removed, you can exclude them uh, just type the correct um, name of the taxa, or if maybe you want to include just several uh, samples, you can do the same. And you can also group the samples based on some categorical columns in your metadata. For example, I was interested in body sites to see if samples from gut were any different from palms and tongue. Um, so after taxonomy analysis, uh, we go on to phylo phylogenetic tree. So this is um, this will show how similar our representative sequences are, and it starts from multiple sequence alignment, and then um, the there are a few algorithms are available to um, build the tree, fast tree, and IQ tree. This is mainly used for core metrics, but you can also extract the tree and visualize it in, for example, Fig Tree or any other tool that helps visualize um, phylogenetic tree files. So after that, um, we have, well, looking at this table, the artificial, I just came up with it to show. Um, looking at this table, we see that um, total counts for each sample are different. And in case we can compare sample four and sample one, they're pretty close in total counts. Um, we can't really compare sample three with others, right? So because they have different sampling depth and we can't really run any reliable statistics on something like this. So one of the ways out is to subsample the frequencies um, so that the total count will be the same for all the samples, like here. So we subsample um, all the table and uh, change the table so that the total will be the same. Uh, 
this is not ideal because we we'll lose information. Um, sometimes we even lose whole samples if their uh, sampling depth is lower than uh, what would peak. But this is a good way um, to normalize your samples. So the statistics will be reliable. But how actually uh, should we peak the value? Um, well, for example, how did I peak 100? We should be looking at our samples and their sampling depth. Uh, for example, here, we can see that some samples have sampling depths lower than 1,000. Some have uh, sampling depth a bit less than 2,000. Some are here, but the majority are um, having bigger sampling depth. Also, we can see that the number of features are quite stable starting from here. So it looks like this region um, looks appropriate to take the sampling depth. Um, but if I, it's also very meaningful to look at your groups and if the samples in your groups of interests are still there. For example, if I take sampling depth of 2000, my right palm sample uh, group will be almost, uh, will consist of only two or three samples. But if I take sampling depth 1000, uh, my right palm group will be okay. I can still work with it. Yeah. Uh, the, the only thing that is left is core metrics, basically calculating all the metrics for alpha and beta diversity using the sampling depth that we just um, identified. And it will give us an idea. So the alpha diversity will give us an idea how things are inside the sample, basically uh, telling us how rich and even our samples with different indices, Shannon index, Philo index. And beta diversity um, will give us an understanding how samples um, are between each other, um, plotting PCA based on different uh, distances like Jacquard or Bay, um, Bay Curtis. And we also can run a permanova test um, on a column that we are interested in. In this case, it was body side. And I got really good p-value, meaning that this um, group has very different um, beta diversity statistics. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, yeah, here I just uh, mentioned some studies that were done using Amplicon and whole genome sequencing of metagenomics. Thank you.